Today, I'm gonna to teach you exactly where to start your diet based on your individual metabolism, goals, and body type. Before we get into the video, do me a favor, like this video if it helps you out. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the little bell so you get notified every single time we drop a new video. Before we get into the actual topic of discussion, we have to determine a few things first. So before we learn how to set up your specific diet, we have to understand why your specific diet might be different than my specific diet. Now, obviously there are certain things that come into play such as your actual goals, how much weight you have to lose, if you are trying to recomp versus just lose weight, there's a lot in this. But the thing I want to focus on specifically today is the individual differences of metabolism. Now, the metabolism is extremely dynamic. And what I mean by that is it's constantly adapting and from person to person to person, it's extremely different. And this presents an issue when we are trying to calculate or formulate a good diet because we know that everyone has an individual difference. So going to an online calculator, punching in your stats for your age, weight, and height, and expecting that caloric intake to be perfect for you is a long shot. So when we wanna get more specific, we have to consider things like metabolic phenotypes. And that's the first thing we're gonna to discuss today. Metabolic phenotypes in a really simple description is just a way that we can categorize different types of metabolisms. There are thrifty metabolisms and there are spendthrift metabolisms. There's a lot of good research on this and I'm gonna link some of those sites and research studies in the description of this. So if you wanna dive deeper into metabolic phenotypes specifically, you can do so there. But for the sake of this video, we're gonna just categorize these two as pretty simple. Thrifty metabolisms struggle to lose weight, spendthrift metabolisms struggle to gain weight. So we can think of this as the person that looks at a cupcake and says they gain 10 pounds and the person who struggles to put on any size and calls themselves a hard gainer. Most of the people watching this video know it's about fat loss. So we're gonna focus on the thrifty metabolism. And the truth is, is I believe there's a lot of genetic and epigenetic, so more environmental things that influence our genes, factors that actually make most of us thrifty metabolic phenotypes. What I mean by that is there's more likely to have people watching this video and working with us that have thrifty metabolisms. They struggle with weight loss. We see this way more often. People who have spendthrift metabolisms don't seek that much guidance very often because well, it's easy for them to not gain fat. So for the people who have thrifty metabolisms, you're the type of person that has a highly adaptive metabolism. And this is the first topic of discussion when it comes to losing fat and determining exactly how your diet should be set up for you. So a thrifty metabolism from a phenotype perspective is somebody who responds to metabolic adaptation extremely quickly. So metabolic adaptation is the second thing we have to define here. Metabolic adaptation is just the act or the process of your body physiologically adapting to the diet itself. So what we see here is pretty simple. Your TDEE, so your total daily energy expenditure, which is comprised of your NEAT, so your non-exercise activity thermogenesis. We're going to have a lot of acronyms here. Your TEF, your thermic effect of food, and then your EAT, which is your exercise activity thermogenesis. And then of course your BMR plays a role in that as well, your basal metabolic rate. All of these things determine the day-to-day -day caloric expenditure you have, which determines your day-to-day -day caloric maintenance. When we drop into a diet and metabolic adaptation starts to occur, which usually happens within the first few weeks, but as you diet longer and longer, it gets more severe. What we see is a slowdown or a drop in TDEE and BMR. BMR BMR can't really be controlled. BMR to an extent is what I am doing right now. Me standing here, some of the molecular and physiological processes of my body just being. So my skin repairing after getting cut, my hair growing, things like that, which we won't even mention much because we can't do anything about that. The other acts of BMR and NEAT that are associated together are things that are pretty subconscious and we can't control as well. How many times I'm blinking in this video, how often I use my hands, how long I stand per day, how much I fidget. We can't really control those things, nor can we track those things. The only aspect of all of this that we can control and track is our step count within our NEAT, our exercise activity thermogenesis, which to an extent you don't have much control over either because as energy goes down, as we go into a calorie deficit, your training's just not gonna be as good. You are going to lose energy and you're not gonna be able to put out as much energy in the gym and that's okay. We just wanna try to maintain as much as we can. And then your thermic effect of food is very minimal from a caloric expenditure perspective, so it's splitting hairs to even worry about, but on top of that, you need to cut calories and food in order to lose weight. And if you cut calories and food, you're eating less, which means your thermic effect of food goes down. All of this to say, our step count is really all that we can focus on and it plays the biggest role in metabolic adaptation for the most part, which means when we drop calories, our step count plummets. 
And we can control that by tracking our step count before we get into the diet and monitoring it and adjusting it as the diet progresses to, in a way, compensate for these metabolic compensations happening. There's two last factors involved in metabolic adaptation. One is the hormonal adaptation. We're also not gonna spend much time on this today because the truth is, is we can't really do much about this. When we take in less food, our hormones adapt. So for guys, your testosterone is gonna lower. For women, you're going to have some sex hormones lower as well. Most people in general are gonna have a thyroid slowdown, which is a primary metabolic hormone. And then of course, we're gonna see cortisol elevate, which is a stress-based hormone. All to say, we really can't do much about this. And even if we implement diet breaks and refeeds, we're only gonna see a temporary fluctuation or elevation in those hormones. And as soon as we go back to the diet, they're gonna drop again. These are also associated with body fat levels. So once you get past the point of sustainably lean, which is where we get into bodybuilding shredded standpoints, you're getting so low in body fat percentage that the amount of body fat tissue on your body is actually negatively impacting your hormonal profile, not just the calories taken in. We can control that during the reverse diet by putting on a little bit more weight and adding calories, but for now we're focusing on losing weight and cutting calories. So we're gonna stay away from that conversation. The next part is cardiovascular adaptation. This one is pretty simple. I like to look at cardio like a vehicle. If you are doing cardio to lose fat, you want to be a gas guzzler. You wanna be something that has a fuel tank that just burns like crazy. And this is because if we are a gas guzzler, we are burning a lot of fuel during our cardio. And in the human body, fuel is calories. Calories is stored fat tissue. So if we look at it this way, it's a pretty good thing to do cardio and burn a lot of fuel. However, we have cardiovascular adaptations to cardio. This is a metabolic adaptation in a way, it's not necessarily because of the diet, but rather because of the repetitiveness of cardiovascular training and aerobic endeavors. And what this means is, the more you do cardio, the better you get at it. The better you get at something, the less fuel you use for that thing. The less fuel you use for that thing, the less calories and fat you burn off your body. And this is why you can't just endlessly do the same exact cardio endeavor and expect to continually or linearly see results. There is diminishing returns. And because of that, we try to save cardio for the tail end of the diet, which again, we'll get to later in the video when we break down the last final stages of your diet protocol. Now that we know what the phenotypes are, what metabolic adaptation is comprised of, and how hormones and cardio and all these things are influenced within metabolic adaptation, we need to come back to those phenotypes and understand the main takeaway from this research on metabolic phenotypes. And that's that everybody's different. And because everybody's different, they are going to respond to metabolic adaptation differently and rather quickly or slowly. And what this means is you might have a very adaptive response or a non-adaptive response. And I'd have you consider that even though adaptive response sounds like it'd be a great thing, you adapt fat loss, it's actually a really bad thing. You don't want to adapt. This goes back to the gas guzzler thing. If you drop your calories and you are a thrifty individual, you will adapt rather quickly and struggle to lose weight because your body compensates so quickly. And what that means is that metabolic adaptations happens faster in the process, and this makes you struggle with weight loss. What we wanna do is set up a diet that allows us to kind of work our way around that thrifty metabolism, maybe beat ahead and not worry about slowing down or wasting time by cutting calories too little and not getting a lot out of it. Because what happens if we cut calories too little and don't see anything is that we're still in a deficit, we're still creating stress, and psychologically it's a burden for the diet, but we're not losing any weight at all. So rather than taking a little bit of calories, we might need to take a more aggressive approach if if we have a thrifty metabolism so that we can jump ahead of that maintenance zone and actually make progress. The first step is finding your maintenance intake. Now I would suggest going online and using a good formula, something like the Mifflin St. Gior is one that I like, but it'll just give you a good baseline. These aren't always gonna be accurate because they don't always take into uh, consideration hormonal or metabolic adaptations that you may have come across that you didn't realize you came across or the inconsistencies of your diet, your activity level, so on and so forth. But they are as close as we can get with a good scientific guesstimate. Uh, we have one on our website, so I'm going to link it in the description. You can use that for free on our blog and you can get a good idea of a baseline caloric intake. But what I would also do is track your intake for a little bit and then create an average. Ideally two weeks, but at least one week. And what you would do is you would weigh yourself every single day and you would measure your calories every single day as well. And at the end of the week, you're gonna take your average weight and your average calories. And if you have two weeks, it's even more accurate. But what you will find is that your weekly caloric intake is gonna break down to an average number and your weekly average weight is gonna break down to an average number. And what it takes to maintain that weight is gonna be based on your weekly caloric average. If you are not dieting, 
dieting right now. If you are maintaining your weight and you are tracking your calories, you will find the perfect number. And it's more accurate than any formula online because, well, it's what you're literally doing as long as you are being accurate with your intake in your food logs. The next thing to know with your maintenance intake is that it's not a set number. So although we will finish this formula or this tracking process and have one number, say, 2000 calories for your maintenance intake. Maintenance is a moving range. Every day we have different sleep patterns, different training levels, different recovery demands, different stressors, different food intake. So the thermic effect of food, the exercise activity thermogenesis, our neat, all these things fluctuate and change. And based on that, our maintenance is gonna shift back and forth. So I like to look at it as a moving target rather than a dead set bullseye. And what that means is that if you had 2000 calories for your maintenance, it is more than likely somewhere between 1800 to 2200. That's not to say that there's always a 400 calorie range around that number. Depending on having a thrifty or spendthrift metabolism, it could be 18 to 2000 or it could be 2000 to 2400. It's very, very individual. However, the point is nothing is exact and that's the main take home point I want you to take away from tracking and understanding your maintenance intake. Now we need to create a calorie deficit. One mistake I see a lot of people make, and this is what really prompted us to make this video and talk about thrifty metabolisms, is that people wanna take a very slow and conservative approach. And the reason they wanna do that is justified. Research shows that a slower weight loss progress is actually a much better process. The reason is because you will maintain health, hormones, stray off metabolic adaptation for longer, and you will maintain more muscle tissue and training performance in the gym for a longer period of time or throughout the whole process. Most of us wanna lose fat, not just weight, which means that we wanna maintain some health and we definitely wanna maintain our muscle tissue the entire process of the diet so that when we get done losing fat, we still have that muscle tissue intact. But the problem with this is if we start too little, we start with too much of a conservative approach or a slow and steady approach, we don't break through that maintenance range I talked about. So for example, if you wanna pull five to 10% of your calories, which is a common caloric adjustment that I would recommend somebody make when they hit a plateau. If you take that away at the beginning when you're at maintenance, you might've gone from 2000 to just 1900 to 1800, which as I explained before, is still in that maintenance range. So nothing happens. Your body adapts very quickly. You don't lose any weight. However, you notice psychologically and probably physically that you're eating less food. So your energy might go down, your steps might even go down, but psychologically speaking, you are dieting. And a big component of diet fatigue, which is the act of really just getting sick and tired of dieting over time is the psychological burden of cutting calories. So you've shot yourself in the foot by not losing any weight, but cutting calories from a psychological perspective. And the thing I wanna share with you to back this up is that most research uses pretty large deficits. So for example, the Matador study, it's a very popular study where they dieted for two weeks on, two weeks off, and then there was another group that just dieted 16 weeks straight. So we had two groups, one was intermittent calorically restricting, which means going back and forth between maintenance and diet phases, and one group was just dieting all the way through. But they used a 33% deficit. 33% calorie reduction. Another example is the ice cap trial, which is from Jackson Piaz. And we actually interviewed him and we have a video on diet breaks in our YouTube channel. So you can check that out on our page. And in their study, they also had about a 20% calorie deficit for their people. I believe it was about a 500 to 600 calorie deficit per day. And it depended on the individual and their current maintenance intake and weight, but it boiled down to about 20% when I did the calculation. And then last but not least, another person that was interviewed in that same video, Dr. Bill Campbell, did a refeed study with five days of dieting two days of refeeding and the non-refeed group was in a 25% deficit and the refeed group was in a 35% deficit. All this to say that anywhere between 20 to 35% of a deficit, dropping calories is very common. So that's like being at that 2000 calories and going right to 1500, which sounds like a big number to people. But it's just to show you that when we look at research and scientific ways to lose fat, they are creating pretty large deficits right at the beginning. And that's why they are able to see significant results in such a short period of time. So the reason people extend diets for a really long period of time and they get very frustrated without seeing results is often because they have a thrifty metabolism and they don't break through that maintenance range. All of this to say, when we are creating our calorie deficit, do not take too conservative approach. Try to aim for at least 15% of calories, and I wouldn't recommend going over 30% most of the time, just because it is a very difficult process to adhere to when we cut too many calories. But if we stay between that 15 to 30% for our first adjustment from maintenance calories, we're gonna set ourselves up for much more success. The next question on most people's mind is how do we determine our macronutrient intake? Now the truth is, is I could spend two hours talking about this. In fact, I have a whole video series talking about calories, macros, meal 
timing, everything like that. So we'll link that in the description. You can check out those videos as well. And we also have a free ebook that goes over macros. But in general, what I am going to point out is that anybody watching this video is probably gonna wanna be on a high protein diet. If you're watching this video, I gotta expect that you are strength training and you are interested in losing fat and or building muscle. Therefore, you're going to need a high protein intake. High protein intakes are also associated with a lot of other health benefits and longevity. So I would recommend getting about 0.8 grams per pound all the way up to 1.5 grams per pound. 1.5 grams per pound is a lot of protein. That's like somebody at 200 pounds eating 250 grams of protein, which isn't that crazy in the bodybuilding space. It's also not necessary for muscle growth beyond one gram per pound, we're not seeing much benefit from muscle growth. However, there's a lot of research that actually may show that we preserve more muscle tissue, we create more of a satiety effect because protein is the highest satiating nutrient from macros, making the diet for fat loss easier to adhere to. And there's even some research that showed more fat loss in the group that actually had higher protein. Now the thermic effect of food is much higher, but we don't know that that would actually contribute to that many calories burned. So some of the researchers I've interviewed actually don't know why this is the case, but nonetheless, it does happen and it's been repeated. So for the most part, my, my simple recommendation after you create your calories, focus on a high protein diet. For carbs and fats, there's three simple steps that you need to focus on. Number one, only track them if your adherence is gonna be high. Meaning if you track your calories and protein and that's all you can handle, stick with that. That's gonna be enough. Number two, choose a higher ratio of whatever one you're gonna adhere best to and suits your training or lifestyle. So if you're not that active or you really crave fats, have a high fat, low carb diet. You're still gonna see great success. Now on the contrary, if you are training very hard, you're interested in building muscle and you are very active, then you want to focus on a high carb, low fat, approach. And the third thing to mention here is the more advanced you get, the more specific you need to be. So even if you love fats, but you're a high volume bodybuilder trying to get shredded, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. You should probably just bite the bullet, lower your fats, increase your carbs. It's going to be much more beneficial. And if your goals are that specific, I imagine you're serious enough to lean towards optimization versus what is more flexible and comfortable to you. Now, the last thing to cover in this video is cardio and diet adjustments as the diet in the fat loss phase progresses. The big thing to remember here is number one, we already made a very large adjustment to calories. And in my experience working with thousands of people at this point and doing this for over a decade myself, if you make a big enough adjustment in the beginning, you can ride that adjustment for a long time as long as you are here and you consistently follow the macros pretty well. So if your precision's there and your consistency's there, that first adjustment's probably gonna last quite a while. But because it was a very large adjustment, any further adjustment is going to nudge you even further. So that maintenance range, although it does float, in my experience, the lower your calories get, the smaller that maintenance window and range gets. And because of that, you can expect to adjust your calories by five to 10% of total calories when reducing. That means reducing your calories by five to 10% when you reach a plateau. And a plateau would be determined by at least one to two weeks of stalled weight loss, but upwards of two to three. I wouldn't be rushing after a single week in most cases, unless there is a dead set timeline. You would adjust your calories by five to 10% via carbs or fat. Most of the time if training is very serious and I can pull from fats without having any serious hormonal issues or health problems, I'm gonna pull from fats before carbs, but at a certain point you have no choice to pull from both. Now, when it comes to cardio, cardio is safe for the end. So I encourage everybody to strength train, follow their diet, use the macros and the calories as your tool for getting the weight loss because it's a much more accurate and metric tool to use, whereas cardio can fluctuate based on your metabolic adaptation and your energy levels, as well as the equipment you're using. So it's not nearly as accurate. Even the step counters and trackers we use, they're not that accurate either. So it's best to focus on your diet and leave that as your priority tool and tracking metric for the fat loss to occur. But when you do add formal cardio on top of your steps and training, it's best to add low intensity cardio. The reason for this is because by the time you're finally adding this cardio, you're probably already pretty fatigued. If you add high intensity intervals, it is going to crush your nervous system even more and that's gonna make your strength training harder. So add low intensity cardio at about two to three days per week. I suggest at a 30 to 40 minute increment. The reason for that is because you're gonna burn more calories and you wanna just get in and get it done. You only need to add two or three days and you'll be fine for a while. But the point is, is we're doing this at the tail end of our diet, which means we only have six weeks or less, let's say, in our fat loss phase. And the reason I usually wait till then is because again, your body adapts fairly quickly. So if you add it too soon and then your body adapts, now you're stuck doing cardio for weeks and weeks and weeks on end when it's not doing that much for you. I'd rather get as much as I can out of NEAT 
in macros and calories because those are gonna be more lifestyle friendly and easy to adhere to. And then add cardio later on in the diet. All right guys, so I hope this taught you a lot about the individual differences of metabolisms really in person to person, how we need to shift and adapt the diet to the specific individual, their individual metabolism and their goals at hand. Most people will watch this and then wonder, well, what do we do after the diet? Does, do these things influence the reverse diet? They absolutely do. We will be shooting another video on recovery versus reverse diets in the future, but we also have two separate videos on reverse dieting that are very popular and are very to the point that will teach you a ton, as well as an article on periodization, metabolic adaptation, and reverse dieting. So we have a ton of content. We'll link that all in the description so you guys can go learn more about those and expect a future video comparing a recovery diet, which is a fast reverse diet, and a reverse diet video, which is a slow process reverse diet and how we can determine which phenotype or metabolic differences each individual needs to choose between those two paths. But for this video, that's all I got for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions whatsoever for me, drop a comment below. Make sure you like the video if it helped you. And last but not least, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, get notified every time we drop a new video. I'll catch you next time.